Hello everybody, how are you doing today? Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Um, <clears throat> before we get started with the lecture today, we are right here. We're going to talk about uh, problem solving and search. Um, I made a post about this on D2L, but I just wanted to remind people that uh, the assignment originally was going to be given out uh, today, but I've pushed back that to, uh, to Thursday. Um, the reason for that is last term when I gave out assignment one, it was uh, lecture three was on a Thursday instead of a Tuesday. And so what I did was on that Thursday, I squeezed in a sort of half-assed um, explanation of assignment one on Thursday in order to give people that extra like five days to work on the assignment. Um, but this term, it's on a Tuesday. Uh, lecture three. And so we are actually only, we would only be giving an extra two days and assignment one wasn't really fully going to be explained until uh, Thursday anyway. And so um, that's what we're doing. We're, we're doing assignment one on Thursday. And today we'll just be giving a lecture. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And so there's going to be one week to complete the first assignment, but the first assignment will be very easy and um, in terms of the amount of work that you have to do. So um, and let's be real, like I said in the D2L post, even if I release the assignment today, you're not going to start it until the weekend anyway, right? So, um, also keep in mind that there is on D2L, there is a post with a, uh, a spreadsheet, uh, in which you can, uh, look for a group member for doing your assignments or, or looking for a partner. Uh, the last time I looked, that sheet had about eight names on it, um, that really makes no sense. Um, you shouldn't just go to the sheet and put your name in. I am not pairing people up, okay? So that sheet is for students to list their name or to contact someone, okay? So if all you did was list your name, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get a partner for your assignment. So please contact the people who are already on the sheet. And as soon as you find a partner, please remove your name from the sheet. So that's not you submitting your names to me to be put into groups. That is for you to be able to uh, find people to, to work in groups. Uh, so yeah, so the assignment is moved back to Thursday. You can use the spreadsheet if you want to get um, a partner for the assignments. And if you are trying to um, figure out whether or not you want to do the assignments with a partner or by yourself, I highly recommend assignment one as a sort of test case because it's by far the least work in the course for any assignment. So if you look at the five assignments, um, Assignment two is probably three times as much work as assignment one. So if you want to test yourself out on assignment one, that's fine. However, if you're really, really new to JavaScript, you may want to have a, uh, a partner for assignment one because that's the sort of getting used to JavaScript assignment. Great, I think that's all the announcements I have. So let's get started. So, uh, lecture three is on problem solving and search, and then we're going to talk about search strategies. So we talked about agents and environments last time, agents and environments, or, um, you know, the place that the agent is in the, is the environment and the agent is going to be the thing that we're trying to make decisions for within that environment. In order to solve those problems, well, we need a strict definition of the word problem. So let's look into that. So, little recap from last time, problem solving agents. So rational agents are going to maximize their performance. Remember last time we talked about performance, me performance measures and rational agents are agents that maximize that performance measure. So the simplest case of a performance measure that I can think of is just satisfying a goal condition. So for example, can you reach the end of a maze? Can you solve this Sudoku puzzle, for example? So just a satisfy, a satisfaction of a goal condition. Um, so this would be a problem solving agent. It's a type of goal based agent. And essentially what a problem solving agent tries to do is find a sequence of actions that satisfies some goal condition. So let's give a concrete example of this. 
Here's an example scenario. Um, if you are a student at, at Memorial, hopefully you recognize what this is. This is um, part of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. This is the island of Newfoundland. So that's where our, uh, down here in St. John's, this is the island that's off the east coast of Canada. And it is, uh, St. John's right here is where our campus is located. We also have um, campus located on the west coast of the province as well. So enough of that. And by the way, someone just typed something in the chat so I know that people can hear me because I haven't actually seen anyone type anything yet. So I just want to make sure that we're, uh, we're actually broadcasting fine. Um, so here's the example scenario. Let's say a tourist comes to Newfoundland. Okay, okay perfect. The sound is great. Um, so a tourist comes to Newfoundland and they land in St. John's. And that tourist wants to go to one of these two cities, or I guess towns. Um, so Porta Basque, does anyone know where Porta Basque is in Newfoundland? Well, it's down here in the southwest. So they either want to go to Porta Basque or they want to go to St. Anthony. Okay, St. Anthony or St. Anthony if you're if you're a local. So they're they're right here. They want to get either to here or to here. Um, they could possibly have some extra constraints on that problem, right? So for example, uh, I only have 15 hours or I only have three days. That would be like a time constraint. Or you may have a financial constraint. Maybe I only have so much uh, total money to spend on gas or something like that. So, um, so there may be these extra constraints in some of our problems that we're trying to formulate as well. So how do we, so artificial intelligence requires an algorithm, right? And so the algorithm has to have a very set format for the input and the output. And as computer scientists, we really want to formulate our problem descriptions as, as formally as, as possible so that our algorithms can process these things and actually produce results. So how do we actually form our goal in a formal way? So we're going to define a goal as a set of states in the environment. So the goal is satisfied if one of them is reached. So for our previous problem, the goal states or the set of goal states is St. Anthony or Port of Basque. It's the places that we want to be in um, to solve our problem. So the goal is satisfied if one of those states of the environment is reached. So if a sequence of actions leads us to the goal state from the start state, then the goal has been satisfied and the problem is solved. Okay, that's how we are defining um, problem solving. In this case, the goal is a set of states. It's really easy. So I want to be in this city or I want to be in this city. The goal could also be um, formulated in a different way. So for example, a goal could also be a function evaluation. So a set of states, that's sort of like the easiest possible goal that you could have. But you could also say, um, like, let's say we're playing StarCraft. I want the enemy's health to be less than or equal to zero. That is the, that is the goal. Or I want, if I'm playing chess, I want the enemy to be in checkmate right? Or if I'm playing something like Zelda, um, the player has all the pieces of the Triforce and Ganon is dead, okay? So the goal is exactly what you want to accomplish and you have to be able to specify that formally somehow. So that's the goal. What about the overall problem formulation? It may actually be a little more um, difficult than you realize to form a problem that you can then translate into an algorithm. So first, let's look at our problem of Newfoundland. Which states do we want to consider? So what do I mean by that? So let's think of the actual problem of navigation in a real world, right? So what would I consider to be a place that's different than another place, right? Am I going to want to like think of like every possible square inch or square meter or square kilometer in the province? Or could I have something more abstract, like the towns in Newfoundland, for example, right? So a state could be, I am in this town or I am in this town. Once we decide on what the states are, which actions do we consider, right? So if I had, for example, broken up Newfoundland into a grid of like meters, 
then an action might be move left by one meter. But if I had broken it down into towns instead, then an action might be move from town X to town Y. Okay, so how you actually break up the problem into states determines what sort of actions are going to be legal as well. And what sort of information is going to be stored as we go along with our problem. So in these nodes, and we'll talk about nodes in a little bit. So for example, maybe the current town location, or maybe how far we've come so far, or the time that we've driven so far. So we have to keep all of these things into consideration when we are specifically defining our problem. So what makes a well-defined problem that we can actually apply some sort of artificial intelligence to, some algorithm, and get a result? First, we need to know the initial state that the agent starts in, right? So where do we start in this environment? We need to know the actions that are possible from each state. So can I move up, down, left, and right? Or is it between towns? Or um, are there teleporters, etc.? Um, and so the actions, as we discussed previously, will define the transition or successor function that takes one state and moves it into another state. We also need the set of goal states, right? So the things that we want to accomplish here, so get to port -a basque for example. Or if we don't have a set of goal states, we need some sort of goal test function like hit points less than zero. And finally, we need the action cost function. So the cost is essentially going to be an evaluation on how good or bad your solution is. So for example, if all you care about is getting to port -a basque and you don't care how long it takes you, then essentially, you know, you're not going to have a cost. You're just going to have whether or not the goal is satisfied. But for example, if you wanted to get there as fast as possible, then time would be your cost. Right? So you're trying to minimize the cost. And so if you take all the actions in the path from the start to the goal, you take all of their costs and you sum all of the costs of all of the actions, then we say that is the path cost or that is the solution cost to this problem. All right. So here is our example problem definition, but now we're, we're specifying it a bit more formally. So our initial state is going to be St. John's. Our actions are going to be, okay, let's take the slightly easier problem of our states are going to be towns in the province, and our actions are going to be traveling along a road to the next town. Okay, those are our actions. Our goal states are St. Anthony or port -a basques and our action cost function is going to be either travel distance or time or gas money or whatever. Okay, we can pick whichever one we want. And so this is how we would um, define a problem in a well-formulated way. And if I asked you to define a problem on an exam, wink, wink, this would be the sort of thing that you would do. I would want to have these four things. Now, of course, you also need to have the like complete environment description, right? Like we talked about that last time. You need to know what the environment is because that determines like the state transition, fun transition function, what actions are possible, etc. So if we're able to find a solution, what does that look like? What is an actual solution for our problem? Well, we're going to call the solution a path. And the path from a start state to the goal state is an ordered sequence of actions. So we're going to start in St. John's. We're going to maybe go to Gander, then we'll go to Deer Lake, and then we'll go to port -a basque okay? That is our path, and the path is an ordered sequence of actions. It matters what order you take the actions is in. The solution cost, so how good or bad the solution one was, is the path cost. So typically, this is the sum of the costs of the actions. There are exceptions, but we're not going to deal with that in this course. And most problems are going to assume that all costs are greater than zero, okay? Because if you have an action that has a zero cost, it means you can just do it infinitely and you occur no cost. Or if you have a, an action that has negative cost, it means that somehow, like, you can do that over and over and over and your path gets better. So typically when we're talking about search and problems like this, we're just going to assume that all costs are finite and they're positive, okay? So they're greater than zero. And so 
the optimal solution is going to be the solution that has the lowest path costs among all possible solutions. So different, um, like for example, if I'm navigating from St. John's to St. Anthony, there are many, many different paths that I could take, but depending on what my cost function is, so if it's distance, then there will be one optimal path from St. John's to St. Anthony. And that will be the one, if I'm worried about distance, that has the um, the lowest sum of distances of all my actions. So essentially, how far did I drive, right? So there may be multiple solutions to any given problem instance, and that means that there are multiple paths that you can take. But typically in artificial intelligence, we are going to be concerned with the optimal solution. Which solution has the lowest possible cost? But of course, getting any solution is better than getting no solution. So let's have a look at a sample problem that's played on a graph, okay? So I could have had this here um, be in St. John's, but let's let's get algorithmic with it and we'll talk about a graph problem. So, you know, this is a third year course. Hopefully everybody knows what a graph is. Um, so this is a graph over here representing our problem space. In this graph, we have five different states of the environment that our agent could be in. So for example, state A, B, C, D, and E. And over here, we have an edge drawn between two states if it is legal to take an action to get from one state to another state. And the label here, the number, is the cost of taking that action. So for example, it costs us six to go directly from A to B, okay? So that's what this means. This is our environment definition for this problem. So let's look at a specific problem instance in this environment. So a specific problem instance might be, um, okay, my initial state is state A. That's where I'm going to start in this, in this environment. My actions are, okay, moving from a state, um, from one state to another state is legal if there's an edge between them. So for example, you cannot move directly from state A to state E. You may be able to take several actions that will get, get you there, but the action A to E is not legal because there's no edge in this graph. The goal state is going to be state C. So I want to end up in state C. And the action cost function is going to be the edge label here. So for example, um, the cost of going from A to B is six because we have this here. Cool, that's pretty intuitive. And you have probably seen something like this in a previous programming or algorithms course. So if I gave you this exact problem on an exam and I said, I want you to describe the properties of this environment for me, you would say it's fully observable. There's no hidden information. It's static, so there's no randomness. It's discrete, meaning that each state is its own independent state. It's deterministic, there's no randomness, okay? Sorry, static, yeah, static versus dynamic. So static here, uh, I said no randomness up here, that was a mistake. Static meaning it's not dynamic in that the environment is not moving without you. You have to take an action in order for the state to progress. Uh, it's deterministic, so there's no randomness. It's single agent, so one agent is moving around in this environment. And it's sequential, meaning that one action um, influences the location, therefore it influences future actions. So this is what you would say if I asked you to list all six of the properties for this environment on an exam. Okie doke. So what is the objective here? Um, maybe we're trying to ask our algorithm, hey, is a path to the goal possible? Is it possible to get from A to C? Well, as humans, we can glance at this graph and say, yes, it is. it's easily possible to get from A to C. We may ask the harder question of what is actually the shortest path to the goal given the costs of these actions? Now, based on which of these objectives we have, we're going to ask which algorithm should we use? Right? And so, so far, we have not discussed any algorithms in this class. We've just said, hey, some of these magical algorithms exist. So, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce our first type of algorithm in the class, which I'm really excited about because um, my entire field of research is on these types of algorithms. So, let's try search. Okay. What is search? So at any time, an agent is going to be at a particular state. 
it's standing here, and it's going to have several available actions. Like I could move from A to B, I could uh, press the button on the elevator, I could uh, move to the left or move to the right. I'm going to have a number of different actions that are available to me. The agent is going to be able to do those actions and transition the state. And in doing so, it's exploring different sequences of those actions. So you could say, what if I move up, then up, then left, then left, then up? Or what if I moved right, right, down, left, right? So the agent is going to try a number of sequences of those actions. And then the agent is going to, based on all of the things that it tried, it's going to choose the best sequence that it found and best here meaning that its performance measure was maximized or the cost was minimized. And this process in general is called search. So I have a bunch of different actions. I'm going to explore using those actions. And then the best sequence of actions that I found, that's what, I, that's what my search, meaning I've tried a bunch of different things. I searched for the best solution and I'm going to take the best sequence that I found if I found one that satisfied the goal. So, search is the process of exploring the problem state space. Remember we talked about state space last time? And the state space being a, conf like the state space is the set of all possible configurations of states. So, um, the process of searching the state space is going to generate what we call a search tree, okay? So it's a tree of actions leading to new sequences. And the search tree is going to have nodes and it's going to have edges, okay? So I want to make this distinction very, very clear, very immediately, because there's always, uh, this is a, this is always a little bit of a struggle to intuitively get over this little hump, okay? And that there is a difference between states of the environment and nodes in the search tree. Okay, so over here, we have states of the environment. So if, if this was a real world problem, um, St. John's is a state of the environment, right? Gander is a state of the environment. Corner Brook is, the, is a state of the environment. So over here, A is a state, B is a state, etc. Edges in the environment description here, in this particular graph-based system, represent whether or not actions are legal, okay? So again, A, B having an edge in this environment graph description means that that's a legal action. Over here on the left, I'm going to be drawing the search tree. The search tree, even though this is a circle with an A in it, in the search tree, tree they are nodes, okay? They are not states. So the process of searching, um, for example, if I went from St. John's to CBS to Gander, that is a process of going through different nodes in the search tree, okay? So nodes are different from states, and we'll be going over that a number of different times, but I'll just show you right now. So the process of search is going to look something like this. This is a, a general abstract form of search in which we are going to try different actions. So if I'm at state A over here, that's my initial state. So my search tree, the root node of the search tree is going to be representative of me. I am currently starting the search. I have not gone anywhere yet and I am at state A. So there's a node over here representing that I'm currently at state A. So now I know that I have two actions that are legal to me. I can go from A to B and I can go from A to D. So what I do now is I'm going to visit those neighbors. I'm gonna try those actions. The name for trying those actions in search is called expanding, okay? So I am going to take the two actions that I can perform from A to B and A to D and I'm going to do something called expanding the search tree. So I'm making the search tree bigger by carrying out those actions and making new nodes. So here now, I, I have expanded the search tree. If I go down this path, it means that I started in state A 
and I went to state D. If I go down this path, I started in state A and I went to state B. So I wanna make this very clear that this right here, a node in this search tree, does not mean that that is state D only. A node in the search tree involves all of its parents back up to the root, okay? So what this node right here represents is I started at A and I went to D. So any node on the search tree doesn't represent a state, it represents a path that you've taken so far. It represents a sequence of actions that you have taken, okay? So we've expanded this far. Now what we're going to do is we're just gonna choose another node in the search tree to expand that we haven't expanded yet, okay? So let's just say that I chose D. So what are the legal actions from D? Well, I look over here at my problem environment and I say, okay, I can go from D to A, from D to B, or from D to E. So let's expand D and we'll make our search tree bigger. So look, now down here, this node represents that I am currently at state B, having traveled from state A to state D to state B, okay? So a node in the search tree is representative of the entire path to that node on the tree, not just a state. Now, it's unfortunate that, you know, there's very few ways for me to visualize this sort of thing, but like nodes in the search tree have parent pointers back to the state, back to the node that they came from, etc. And we'll get into all of that. That's going to be more obvious in the future. I just want to hammer home the point that nodes are different than states. And you may be asked on an exam why that is. Okay. Now let's choose another. We can just choose any, any node that we have to expand. So let's expand B. B can go to A, to D, to E, or to C. So there we go, we have expanded B. So right here, this node represents me starting at A, going to B, and then going to E. And I can carry on this process, and what I can do is just continue until I've found a goal, okay? So that process would continue until I have somehow satisfied one of my goal conditions. So remember again, these over here are nodes in the search tree. Over here on the right, I've just crammed it into the same slide. Those are states in an environment, okay? So someone asked the question, wouldn't this search tree go on forever? So A is D's child and D is A again. It certainly can. And we are going to talk at length about that as we go through this lecture, but that's a good observation, okay? So, and actually, you said go on forever. That's actually my next slide. So keep in mind that the state space is finite, okay? Meaning that the, the state space only has a few states in it, it's finite, but the search tree is possibly infinite, okay? So you said go on forever, the, you know, the technical term, we would say it's it can go on infinitely. So as um, they pointed out, you can go from A to D to A to D. So that just represents you starting at A, going D, A, D, A, D, A, D, A, and you may get stuck right? Depending on the order in which you traverse the search tree, that is going to be what this whole lecture is about and, and the different type of properties. So here's another example of a search tree, okay? Let's take the 15 puzzle. And this is actually, so it's called the 15 puzzle, but this has nine numbers instead of 15. So uh, just let me know out in the chat if you've ever played this puzzle before. So in this puzzle, the actions represent how you slide tiles around in this puzzle. It's also called the sliding tile puzzle. So for example, I could move the eight over to the right, or I could move the four up, or I could move the six over. And your goal is to turn this into this, where it's a blank in the top left or in the bottom right, doesn't really matter. And then you have all of the numbers in order, okay? So this is called the sliding tile puzzle. And you can build a search tree of the sliding tile puzzle just like you could for that graph search, okay? It's just that the nodes get a little bit more complicated. So for example, we're gonna start up here, and I know this is a little bit small, make sure you're watching on 1080p. Um, but up here, the three different actions that I could have are move the six down, move the seven to the right, or move the five to the left. So 
I'm going to expand that state in the environment into these three different nodes, right? So over here, this is the one where I slid the seven over. This is the one where I moved the six down. And this is the one where I moved the five, oh, sorry, the five to the left. And then we try all the possible combinations of this. And look, down here, we've found a goal, for example. So in this case, uh, they wanted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to go all around in a circle instead of being like rows or whatever. But that is the process of doing search. We start at an initial state, we take actions, we form the search tree, and eventually one of the nodes in the search tree, hopefully, is representative of a goal state. Okay? So, the important thing here is how did we choose which of these nodes to expand? Right? We were just kind of choosing randomly. We were going left to right here just to make the slides look nice. But how you choose which node to expand in the search tree is called the search strategy. All right? So we're going to talk about a number of different search strategies in the remainder of the lecture, but I'm quickly going to make a little aside first. But just realize that how we expand is called the search strategy. Okay. Now, I said that nodes and states are very different, and they are. Nodes represent a path that you have taken in your search so far, right? So a node all the way down here, if I go from A to D to C, back to D and then to E, this node represents essentially this path to that state, okay? So this is the path that we have taken. So therefore, whenever we go to store our nodes and form this tree, we're going to have a bit more bookkeeping to take care of, okay? So what is actually stored inside a node, and this is going to be very relevant for our first assignment, we're going to do this. So, um, you probably want to store some sort of representation of the state, right? So for example, uh, in this down here, you know, we would say, okay, uh, at this node, we've gone, we're currently at state A in this path. So this is the state that we're currently visiting along this path through this node. We're also going to store the parent node. And the parent node is the node that generated this node. So for example, the parent of this node is this node, okay? Um, we're going to maybe store the action that produced that node. So which action produced this? Maybe it was moving to the left. Maybe it was shooting an opponent. Maybe we'll store that action. We may want to, to compute or store the path cost so far. So that's the cost of going from the start to this so far. Um, we may also want to store the depth, okay? Um, so for example, what is the, not only the cost, but what is the number of actions so far? So let me just go back and I'll do a little example of this. So here, if these are actual nodes, right? Let us go down to this node and try and figure out, uh, not that one because that actually ends up being the goal node. Let's actually go here and figure out all the bookkeeping stuff, right? So what was the action that produced this node? Well, the action was going from D to E, okay? What is the parent node of this node? Well, it's this node, right? So we could store a pointer in memory or just a, you know, an object store or something like that. Um, so down here, uh, what is the cost so far? So going from A to D ended up costing one. So the cost at this node would be one. So the cost of the original node is zero because we haven't gone anywhere yet. So we add one to that. Now we're currently at one. And now from D to E is going to cost one as well. And so the cost, I don't know why that uh, line just drew, the cost is going to be two. That is the cost so far, okay? And it just so tur turns out that the depth is also going to be two because we've made two actions. Um, so someone said we could go from A to D, so wouldn't that make D the parent of A again? So in intuitively, yes. However, remember, this node over here, this node, it I drew a D on it for the purposes of, of teaching this, but that is not node D, 
that is a node in the search tree that happens to be at state D on the path so far, right? So the parent of this one is this one. That's not saying that A is the parent of D. No, no, no. It's saying that this happens to be a node and it was generated by this node. So if we come down here to this node, it happens to be at state D, but the parent of this node is this node. Okay, so I understand that the visualization is a little bit confusing, but it's kind of the only way to visualize it like that. Um, but these are nodes, not states. So wherever the line points back up, that is the parent of that node. Okay, so we may want to store all of this different data inside our nodes to help us with our bookkeeping as we go along. And we may want to store other things too, like we could have some optimizations, like we could store the legal actions or heuristics. We'll get into all that later, but you can store other data as well inside the node. So again, I'm driving this home because it's very, very important. There is an important distinction between nodes versus states. A state is a configuration of the environment. So I'm in St. John's, for example. A node is a bookkeeping data structure which only exists within a search tree. And a node is on a path in the search tree, okay? So A, this one right here, this node is currently at state A and it has gone on the path from originally being at state A, moving to state B and then going back to state A. So nodes are parts of paths in the search tree and states are just configurations of the environment. All right, I won't repeat it again, just rewind it if you wanna, if you wanna get that distinction again. Now, here is a very important um, term. So this is a new definition. It's called the fringe, okay? So as we are expanding our search tree, so we expanded A, then we expanded D. Anything that is that does not have children yet, so this is called the child of this one. This node is the child of this one. This node is the parent of this one, okay? So nodes that have not yet been expanded, we call those leaf nodes, right? Because if you look at a tree, right, it has branches, and the things at the very ends of the branches where it stops, those are called leafs. And so that's what we call leafs here. So leaf nodes are ones that have not been expanded yet. And the fringe is the set of all leaf nodes, okay? So nodes that have been generated and are part of the search tree, but have not yet been expanded, that's called the fringe. That's the set of nodes that we could choose from to expand next. So for example, in this example, right, we've expanded A into these, then we've expanded this one into these, and so now we have four nodes that are leaf nodes, so our fringe has size four. And we, when we go to expand, we are choosing one of the nodes in the fringe to expand next. Okay, I hope that makes a bit of sense. So we come to our first written pseudocode algorithm. Right? So this process that we went through of creating this search tree, we sort of did it in plain English with a lot of hand waving and drawing of lines. But how do we actually specify this in code, right? So we can actually program it. Well, here we go. So now this algorithm is called general, general uninformed tree search. This tree search this is called tree search because the, the optional textbook, I am taking the nomenclature, the definitions from that book. So if you look at that um, Russell and Norvig AI book, they call this general uninformed tree search. It's called uninformed because it is, not, it is not using any information to try and pick which node to expand. It's just, it's just expanding stuff, okay? So here's our function. The function is called tree search. As inputs to this function, you are going to take 
a problem specification, right? So you got your environment, you got your legal actions, you got your goal, etc. And you're also going to take a search strategy. Now we're going to talk about search strategies, but search strategies will essentially say, which node in the fringe do we want to choose next? That's it. That's what the search strategy is. So we're going to create the fringe. The fringe is just going to be some data structure. Okay, let's call it a set. Let's call it like whatever. So it's going to be a collection of nodes. However, we set that up doesn't really matter. The initial, so the initial fringe is going to be the node that contains the problem's initial state. So let me rewind right here. So when you're at the starting state in the search tree, when you haven't expanded anything yet, the fringe contains a single item, which is essentially, that's the root node of your search, okay? So that's what this says. Our fringe initially is going to be some collection and the only element in that connection is going to be the first node of the problem's initial state. Then we have a loop that's going to loop forever. Okay, there's going to be a condition. It's not actually going to go forever, but we're just going to say while true, we're looking for a goal, right? So let's look at this. If the fringe is ever empty, meaning we have no more nodes to search, that means we haven't found a goal. And so we'll just return false or an empty path or return fail somehow, okay? So if we ever run out of things that we can do, then we have failed to reach our goal. Otherwise, what we do is we're going to select a node from the fringe to check. So this just says, hey, whatever my strategy says to do, which again, we'll get into, it is going to somehow select a node from the fringe. If it's random, uh, the node on the left, the node on the right, the oldest node, whatever, it's going to select some node from the fringe to check next. If the state of that node is a goal state, then we have found a solution, okay? If the, so that we found a solution. So we're gonna return our solution, which is a path. And we'll talk about that later. However, if it wasn't a goal state, we're going to expand the node and then add those children to the fringe. Okay, so that's essentially what we did up here. So let me go back because I wanna show you. Do, 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 do. So we have a fringe that initially has one element. Our strategy is going to, so we, we look at this node, um, sorry, we look at the fringe, it's not empty, so we don't fail yet. Um, we're going to select a node from the fringe. Well, there's only one node, right? So we expand and we add those two nodes to the fringe. Then we're going to select, sorry, I still got the, um, the, the notation here. We're going to select one of these somehow. We're going to check to see if it's the goal. If it's not, we are going to expand. Then we're going to check another node and expand it and add those to the fringe, right? So at this point, all of these nodes down here are in the fringe. That is the exact algorithm that we're doing right here. So again, the, the main while loop says, if the fringe is ever empty, then we have nothing else to search, so we return fail. Otherwise, our strategy is going to select a node to expand. If that node's state is the goal state, or is a goal state, return a solution, Otherwise, we're going to expand that node and add its children back into the fringe. That's the entire algorithm. That is search. At a very high level, this is every single search algorithm. And then every very specific instance of this search algorithm is going to modify it slightly in order to do it in a slightly different way. So I just said the uh, expand down here. So let's look at what that expand function does. So this is the function expand. It's going to take in a node that it wants to expand and the problem description. So what we are doing in the expand function is we are generating the successors, right? We're generating the child nodes in that tree. So we've got some collection to store those successors. Then for every action in the legal actions at that node, 
we're going to generate a new node, okay? So we're going to say whatever the original node's state is, we're going to do the action A and create a new node based on that, okay? We're gonna call that S. The parent of S is the, is the original node, right? So the parent is the node that created this new node. So S.parent equals node. Now, we have a cost which is called the G cost. The G cost is the total cost of all actions so far. So if this is the total cost of all actions so far, then how do we compute that? Well, we look at the cost to get to the parent and add the actions cost, okay? So we say the, the, the G cost of this node is equal to the G cost of the parent node plus the action cost. Then we set the action equal to the action that we just performed. Maybe we'll set the depth of this node equal to depth plus one. And then we're going to add this to the successors. And then what we do is we return successors. So essentially what we do is we take the initial node, we take um, all the actions that are legal from that node, we apply all the actions to the state that that node represents, we do all the bookkeeping, and then we return all those successors. Okay, so this is going to be the most complicated part of the assignment and you've got it done here for you on this slide already. Okay, so that is the general, um, that's how you do general search. So we're going to get into um, some search strategies soon, but first I want to talk about problem solving performance. So now that we have an algorithm to help us solve a problem, how are we going to judge the performance of that algorithm? Is it faster than another algorithm? How much memory will it take? All this stuff is what we're interested in this course because we want to have the most efficient solutions possible. So it turns out there are four ways to measure problem solving performance. And these are going to be the problem solving performance uh, properties of each of these algorithms. So the first one, and probably the most important, is called completeness. So is our algorithm guaranteed to find a solution if a solution exists? That's a pretty important thing. Optimality. So if it does find a solution, is it the optimal solution? Meaning, does it have the lowest cost? Time complexity. How long did it take to find that solution? And space complexity. How much memory is needed to run the search? So these are the four very important exam questions, right? This will be asked on, excuse me, on some exam at some point about problem solving performance. Just a quick note about the space and time complexity is they are measured on the size of the input graph or the, of the problem, okay? So time is going to measure the number of nodes that were generated and space is going to be measure, measuring how much memory is needed to store the maximum number of nodes in the worst case needed at any given time by the algorithm. So time is the number of nodes generated and space is the maximum number of nodes that we need to store in memory at any given time in order to actually run the algorithm. Okay, so Search and AI, when we're talking about space and time complexity, we typically measure the following. The branching factor, we call that B, that is the maximum number of successors at any given node, okay? And that's like the breadth of our search. Breadth of our search. Many of you probably know where I'm going with this. We also have the depth D. So this is the depth of the shallowest goal node. And on average, our tree size to solve a problem, if we use general uninformed tree search, is going to be somewhere around the order of B to the power of D. Because if our tree has B branches and we have D depth, then it's gonna be B times B times B times B, D times until we get B to the power of D, okay? So this is the type of analysis, the algorithm analysis that we're gonna be running on these um, search strategies. So. Just as a recap, a recap of what we've done so far to, to keep you up to speed. 
Problems are defined by the initial and goal states, the actions, and the cost function. An optimal solution has the lowest cost function among all possible solutions. Search is going to find solutions by exploring the search tree. The search tree consists of nodes and edges. Nodes in the search tree are different from states in the problem. And problem solving performance is going to be measured by completeness, optimality, and space and time complexity. Okay, now I know that's a lot to dump on you, but you know, that's what studying is for, is, is to go through all of this and, and recap all of that. But so far, it's been pretty intuitive. So let's get into the second half of this lecture, where I actually talk about search strategies. Okay, so we've, we've been talking and talking and talking about search strategies. What in the hell are they? So, uninformed or blind search. This is a type of search. It's a high-level description of a search algorithm. So in an uninformed or a blind search, we have no information about the states beyond the problem description. So we are essentially just limited to um, generating successors and testing whether or not it's the goal, right? Have we reached the goal? No, generate more children. Have you reached the goal? No, generate more children. What we will get into in this course in the next section is called heuristic search or informed search. And unlike uninformed search, what heuristic search is going to do is going to take some guesses, okay? So we're going to write functions to take guesses um, to see which states are more promising. And we kind of want to head towards those states in our search. And this is going to hopefully lead to faster search episodes. Okay, someone just asked a question. In the node expansion code, what does s.action.cost represent? Line six, here we go. Uh, yeah, so I actually should have had line seven before line six. I apologize for that. But it just says that um, the cost of the path to this node so far is equal to the cost of the path to the previous node plus the cost of the action that got us from the previous node to the current node, right? So um, an example of that would be, let me just go back. If I have gone five distance so far, right? And the previous, the, the, the previous action that I took to get me here cost two units of distance, then I would say, okay, the, the, the distance so far to this node is five plus two, which is seven. Okay. I'm going to go over a bunch of examples of that. That will not, you'll, you'll understand that very quickly. So don't worry. All right. So we have uninformed search and informed search. And we're going to talk about uninformed search first. And then we're going to talk about informed search in a later lecture. So the very first algorithm that we're going to talk about is breadth first search. And I know you're saying, oh, we've done breadth first search. We know this stuff. Why are you teaching breadth first search in an AI course? I can pretty much promise you that you have not been taught breadth first search in this way that I'm going to teach it. And you're going to see by me reteaching breadth first search and depth first search, et cetera, you're going to see how they all, all these algorithms fit together and how similar they all are and it helps us analyze them and truly understand what's going on in these algorithms. Okay, so in breadth first search, first we expand the root node, okay? The node at the top of the tree, we do that first. Then we expand the successors of the root node. Then we expand the successors of those successors. And in general, what we're doing is that all nodes at a given depth of the tree are expanded before any nodes on the next level. Okay, so it, it's breadth first search because we take each depth, each level of the search and expand all of those before we go to the next depth. And so what we have to do to write our algorithm, breadth first search, all we have to do is take the previous algorithm and use a queue for the fringe. What do I mean by that? Okay, here is our general uninformed tree search algorithm, okay? 
all we have to do to change this into breadth first search is use a Q for the fringe. That's it. It's the same algorithm, just very slightly different. Okay, so what does this say? It says that, okay, breadth first search has a fringe, which is a Q. So it's first in, first out. The first thing we put into the fringe is going to be the next thing that we take out of the fringe. And then we do the exact same algorithm. If the fringe is empty, we haven't found a path, so we fail. Otherwise, we pop the next node off the fringe, which is going to give us the next node from the queue. If that node is the goal, return solution. Otherwise, expand and keep going. So here is breadth first search illustrated. We're going to start with the fringe consisting of the root node. Then, since the fringe is a queue, what we're going to do down here is I'm going to keep track of the fringe. Uh, let me put it up here. Okay, so this is the fringe, right? The, this node is right here in the fringe and there are going to be some other nodes. So since this node is the first node, we pop that out of the fringe and we generate its successors and we put these into the fringe. Okay, so now because this one has been popped out of the fringe, right? D was generated first before B. These are both in the fringe. So what we do now is we generate or we expand D because it's, it was next. It's next in the queue. So we generate D. Now on the queue, we would have B or this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. So whenever we go to say which node in the fringe should we expand next, we are going to expand the one that was put into the fringe first. And that guarantees us that we do every single node at a particular level or a particular depth before we go to the next depth. So we'll expand B and then we'll go on and on. And the next one we expand is this one is A, then B, then E, then A, then C. Okay, so that is how breadth first search works. And the reason it's called breadth first is because it goes wide. It does the breadth of the tree before it goes deep. Okay, so, oh, I just turned blue. On our assignment, we are going to have an environment that sort of looks like this. In this environment, you're going to be able to move in different directions from, a different, from various locations. Okay, so if we do a breadth first search in an environment like this, which, which is a grid, we call this a grid environment, it's going to look something like this. We have our initial node down here, and then we're going to expand that node into its successors, and that happens to be all of its neighboring nodes. And then we're going to expand those nodes, right? And we go breadth by breadth by breadth. And so eventually we'll cover the whole area by doing that. Ooh, I'm so red. Okay, so that's breadth first search. That's all that breadth first search is, is we take this general algorithm and we just change the fringe into a queue. That's it. That's breadth first search. Alrighty. Let's analyze breadth first search before we move on to other algorithms. So let's look at each of these properties of breadth first search. First, breadth first search is complete. It explores the entire tree. So it will find a goal node if a goal node exists. And breadth first search will find the shallowest goal node since it explores all nodes at a given depth before the next depth. Okay, so breadth first search will find your solution path that has the fewest number of actions, fewest number of actions. However, BFS is not optimal in terms of cost, okay? In general, breadth first search does not produce optimal solutions since the shallowest node, meaning the one with the fewest actions, is not necessarily the optimal cost path. Breadth first search is going to be optimal if the path cost is non-decreasing in the function of depth. Well, what the hell does that mean? It basically means that if all of your action costs are the same, breadth first search will be optimal, but in general, it is not optimal. And let's look at an example of this, okay? So here's the example. 
let's see, say that we want to move, uh, our initial state is A, and we want to get to state C. So we expand in a breadth first search way. So we expand A to generate D, and then we generate B. Then we expand D to generate its children. Then we expand B to generate its children. And look, at depth, we'll call, call this depth zero, depth one, depth two. At depth two, we have found the solution using breadth first search, right? And the algorithm says, if you find that your node represents a state, which is the goal, then stop. And so as soon as we pick this C, we have stopped. And so we look, well, let's look at our graph over here. So we've gone from A to B to C, A, B, C. The cost of that is six plus five, which is 11. So it may be the path with the least number of actions, but it turns out that there's another path going from A to D to E to C. So A, D, E, C, that path has cost seven. But because it had more actions, breadth first search did not find it. Okay, so breadth first search is complete. It will find a solution if a solution exists, but it is not optimal because it is not guaranteed to find the optimal solution. So what we mean by not optimal is that it sometimes, even once, it won't find the optimal solution. Okay, sometimes it might find the optimal solution, but that does not make it an optimal algorithm. Optimal means that it will always find the shortest path, okay? Or the, yeah, the shortest solution. Let's talk about its performance. So time complexity is going to be big O of B to the power of D. So this is big O notation. Um, each state has B children, and we consider the goal at depth D, right? So if each state has B children, and we're going down D depth, then that's B times B times B times B, right? is O to the, or big O of B to the power of D nodes generated. So if I tell you on an exam to draw a diagram and prove the time complexity of breadth first search, this is how you would do it. The space complexity is also B to the power of D because we have to store the entire tree in memory, unfortunately. As we are generating the tree like this, we have to store the entire previous depth, right? So we have to basically store the entire tree. So whenever I have a green here, it means that this is a very good property. We want that property. We want completeness, but we also want optimality. So I put it in red, meaning it's not optimal, okay? Um, time complexity is in red because this is kind of a bad time complexity. We would want it to be better if possible. Um, however, the space complexity is also kind of bad. This is, I'll show you how bad this is, okay? So the example we just gave, that's not so bad. There's a few tiny nodes, whatever, but the solution was found in depth two, right? So it was almost instantaneous. But how does that translate when we move up to bigger problems? All right. So let's say that we have an average branching factor. So let's say at each state, there are 10 legal actions and we can generate, um, 10,000 nodes per second, and we can do, um, or we can store one node in about a kilobyte. And the hilarious thing is this is almost exactly the parameters of a problem that I've been working on. And so if we can do 10,000 nodes per second with a kilobyte per node, okay, how long do searches take? Well, if we get to depth two, we've only searched about a thousand nodes and we get there in a 10th of a second with one megabyte of memory used. Okay, well, what about depth four? Well, already we've jumped up to 100,000 nodes. We've taken 11 seconds and we have 106 megabytes of memory. Let's go, let's jump up right to depth 12. And you might say, okay, depth 12, 12 isn't a big number, but now we're working in exponentials, right? So we have 10 to the power of 13 nodes that we've generated. It's going to take us 35 years to do that search and we're going to need 10 petabytes of RAM. And I don't know if anyone is watching this in the future when 10 petabytes of RAM is like fits in your Apple watch or whatever, but we're probably not. This is actually a search. Okay. That search is like feasible. It could possibly be done because maybe we have like, you know, a big supercomputer. 
but it's only depth 12. Imagine we have 30 actions that we have to perform. We're talking gigantic state space that we could never solve, right? So b to the power of d, that exponential is not ideal. Alrighty. So now I want to talk about our second algorithm, which is uniform cost search. It's a bit of a tricky name, but I'll explain the name in a bit. So breadth first search is optimal when all costs are equal because it expands the shallowest node, okay? Uniform cost search is going to be our first optimal algorithm because it's going to expand the node in the tree with the lowest path cost so far. That's the difference. That is what uniform cost search is going to do. So if all costs are equal, then this algorithm is going to be equivalent to breadth first search. Um, but if all costs are not equal, then we're going to just, this is going to be uniform cost search. So it works only if all costs are greater than zero. Remember, we're, we're not talking about cost zero or negative cost in this course. And it turns out that uniform cost search is going to be equivalent to Dijkstra's algorithm if you have a single goal. So if you've used Dijkstra's algorithm before, uniform cost search is equal to Dijkstra's algorithm for a single goal. So here is uniform cost search. It's the same tree search algorithm that we've been talking about before. The only change is here, okay? So instead of, for example, when we use breadth first search, we just said, well, give me the next thing in the queue. But for uniform cost search, what we're saying instead is look in the fringe and get the, um, the node that has the minimum G value. And again, the G value is the cost of the path so far. Um, so when it comes to uniform cost search complexity, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky. I'm not going to ask the properties of uniform cost search on an exam. I don't want to get bogged down in these mathematical details, but the important thing is uniform cost search is complete if B is finite. Okay. So if you have a finite branching factor, so uniform cost search is complete. It is optimal. It is also optimal. So where breadth first search was not optimal, uniform cost search is optimal, which is great. And of course, if all action costs are greater than zero, um, meaning they're epsilon, so some at least some small positive value. The time complexity of uniform cost search, however, is a little bit tricky. Um, I just wanted to show this to to have it there. Okay, so. The time complexity is me measured in like path costs, not in depth. So we can't really use B and D for the complexity. So if we have C star be the cost of the optimal algorithm, then this is our complexity, which in the worst case is much, much bigger than B to the power of D. So it turns out that this search time complexity, it will be complete and it will be optimal. However, our time complexity is going to be worse than breadth first search, okay? Alrighty. Depth first search. Someone said, what was the branching factor again? So the branching factor B is the average number of actions that we can take at any state. So it's the width of our tree, essentially. All right. So we've done breadth first search. We've done uniform cost search. Now let's do depth first search. So depth first search, is going to expand the deepest node on the fringe. So the search goes immediately to the deepest level of the search tree to a leaf node. Remember, the leaf is the node that has no successors. If a leaf is reached, then essentially it's discarded and it's backs up, it backs up to a previous depth. So we'll show an example of that. And so in order to implement depth first search, all we have to do, it's the same algorithm as breadth first search, except instead of a queue, we use a stack for the fringe. And in practice, some people usually use a, a recursive algorithm to implement BFS and DFS. We'll show that later, but just watch this. Here is depth first search. We have a stack for the fringe. Here is breadth first search. We have a queue for the fringe. That's it. That's the difference. In breadth first search, 
we take the oldest thing on the fringe. In depth first search, we take the newest thing on the fringe. That's it. It just so happens that the oldest thing on the fringe is breadth. It goes along before it goes down. The newest thing on the fringe goes down before it goes over. Okay, so it's depth first because it goes down first. Isn't that cool? I don't know. When I first like made this connection between breadth first search and depth first search, maybe it was obvious to you, but it wasn't obvious to me how similar they were. And all it is is how you choose the next node to expand and you just have a stack for one and a queue for the other. There you go. So I might ask something on an exam like, what would be the smallest change that you could do to change breadth first search into depth first search? Well, you change a queue to a stack and you're done. Okay. There's also a recursive depth first search implementation. I have included it here. We're not going to... Oh, let's look at it. Okay. So if you want to do this recursively, I'm not going to go into what recursion is. Hopefully you understand that at, at this point. It's third year computer science. So you have a function, DFS. If the state is a goal node, you return solution. Otherwise, you expand the node and the problem. Um, you get successors and then you recurse. So you call the same function with the problem. Okay. So the next time you've got the next state that's down further in the search and you're going to say, is that the goal? No, if not expand and then keep going. Okay. So you call that with the root node and the problem, but don't be too put off by, um, by the recursive version of this. This is the version that I want you to remember. Okay. So if I ask you for depth first search on an exam, I want you to do this version of the, um, of, of that. Okay. Oh, I've been talking so I've been talking a bit slowly, so I'm going to speed up a bit because I didn't realize how late I was going. So I apologize for the length of this, uh, of this lecture. Um, and I promise you that future lectures are not always going to go long. Okay. So, uh, we talked about this. All right. Depth first search performance. Depth first search isn't even complete. Meaning, like, it could enter an infinite loop. So someone asked about this before. You could go from A to D to A to D to A to D, A, D, A, D, and just never find a solution. So depth first search sucks. It's not even complete. And it's not optimal. It just finds the first goal that it happens to find. So <laughs> not only is it not optimal, but it, not, it might not even give us a solution, right? Depth first search performance is is a bit better than breadth first search but still it could be really oh sorry the time complexity is is horrendous right it may go down possibly infinite paths and so it's going to generate b to the m where m is the maximum depth of a node it's like the size of the search tree is the time complexity this has the worst time complexity of all depth first search is really bad on its own however the saving grace of depth first search is its space complexity because it doesn't need to store the entire tree at any given time. It just needs to store the current path at any time. So it's only going to use B times M memory instead of B to the power of M memory. Okay. That's really cool. So let's see if we can come back to that in a bit. Here's how depth first search works in practice. When you're solving a maze, you're going to go as deep as possible. And then when you hit, uh, an end point, you're going to back up and then go as deep as possible in another way and then back up and go as deep as possible in another way and then back up. Okay. So that's what depth first search does. This property of low memory. So how might we be able to take depth first search and modify it so that it has the other properties that we want? Okay. So how are we going to prevent depth first search from sort of getting lost? right? From going super, super deep and never being able to find a solution. We are going to apply, uh, apply a limit to the depth of the search. So we're going to choose some depth limit, call that L that's for L for limit. And we're going to enforce a condition, which is basically says we can't go any deeper than L. So every node at a depth of L or later has no successors. And this is going to solve the infinite path problem. 
because it will search the entire tree up to depth L. But it introduces a new problem, which is that it's incomplete if the solution depth is greater than the depth limit. Meaning that let's say we set a depth limit of 10, but there wasn't a solution until depth 12. Well, this depth limited search would search up to 10 and say, there's no solution, we didn't find it. The time complexity is big O of B to the power of L, which isn't that bad because we're limiting the complexity, right? We're limiting the depth. But our space complexity is great. So we've got O of B times L, that's the space complexity that we want. And all we need to do to do depth limited search, okay, is implement a single cutoff. So we take depth first search and we say, if the node's depth is greater than L, return. That's it. That's the only addition we need to make to depth first search. So this is a recursive version of depth first search. Um, you could do that as well with the, um, with the iterative version of depth first search. But how do we choose a maximum depth for depth for depth limited search, right? Do I choose 10? Do I choose a million? Do I choose 10,000? What do I do? Well, one thing you could do is sort of an analysis maybe of the maximum path length. So you could say, okay, my map has 64 by 64 tiles. So maybe I'll add those up and set that to the depth. Or maybe I know that like my Newfoundland is like a thousand kilometers long or however long it is. Or maybe there's like some number of states in the problem. So you could do a whole bunch of things to try and choose L for you. But how about we just let the search figure it out? That'll be really interesting. So this is another algorithm called iterative deepening depth first search. And the idea is gradually increase the depth limit. So we're going to try a maximum depth of one then a maximum depth of two. If we don't find a solution, maximum depth of three. Go on, so on and so forth until we get up to the solution, okay? So the goal will be found at the shallowest depth that we set here because there was no solution found all the way from depth one to D minus one. So once we hit the depth of a solution, that will be the shallowest solution. So this means that this algorithm actually has the completeness and the optimality of breadth first search. So it's guaranteed to find a solution. It's optimal if and only if the action costs are the same. So it shares that with BFS. But now it has the space complexity of DFS. So it's, that's really cool, right? So what we've done is we've created a new algorithm depth or iterative deepening depth first search, which has the completeness of, of an optimality of BFS. Remember the completeness of optimality of DFS sucked, right? It wasn't complete. It wasn't optimal. Now we have the completeness of optimi optimality of breadth first search, but the space complexity of depth first search, meaning typically when we run a computer algorithm, the time, we have lots of time. We want it to run fast, but we can let it run for hours or months but RAM fills up really quickly, right? You'll probably never last more than a minute in a search algorithm until your RAM fills up if you're using breadth first search. It'll just chew through it. Like I have 64 gigs of RAM. I let my computer run for 30 seconds. I got 64 gigs of RAM used up. So this space complexity is a big deal, right? We're talking about megabytes instead of terabytes, possibly. All right. So time complexity of iterative deepening depth first search. You may think, okay, so what we're doing in depth first search is we set D equal to one. And so the first time we do it, we only look at the root node. Then we set D equal to two. And when we set D equal to two, we're looking at the root node and its successors. Then we set D equal to three and we're looking at all of these again. Then we set depth equal to four and we look at all of these. Right? So you're saying, okay, well, I looked, I'm looking at all of them, but I've also, I've looked at some of those in the past already. So aren't I wasting a bunch of time when I do this? Well, it turns out that no, I'm not because the last depth 
is always going to contain more nodes than everything else combined. And so since I have to do the last depth anyway, then there's really not in the amortized time complexity says that we are not wasting any additional time. So the time complexity is going to be, well, we have a branching factor times D, right? That's our first search. Then we have our branching factor times our branching factor times depth minus one, right? So that's what we have here. Then we have, we're going to add up all these levels until we get to B to the power of D. However, as we know, because we did a course on algorithmic time complexity, the largest D is all that we care about. And so all these terms go away and we just get the time complexity of B to the power of D. So we actually have the same time complexity as BFS. We have the same space complexity as DFS. In practice though, because... It has the same algorithmic big O notation time complexity, but in practice, we do approximately twice the amount of work. But twice the amount of work is fine. Twice the time I can do, but I'm saving exponential memory. So in general, whenever you can, you want to use iterative deep ding depth first search over breadth first search, okay? Now, you are never going to implement iterative deepening depth first search in this course. Don't worry about it. I just wanted to show you iterative deepening depth first search so that you understand, okay, we can take one algorithm, apply a limit, do all these cool things to these algorithms. Okie dokie. Um, so this was the algorithm for recursive depth limited search. I'm not gonna go over this too much because you're not implementing it in, in the course. So for iterative deep, this was the algorithm. We've already talked about that. Iterative deepening depth first search looks like this. We have this function, depth limited search, which takes in a node, a limit, and a problem. And what we're going to do for depth, uh, iterative deepening depth first search is we're going to say um, for D from one to infinity, call depth limited search on D as the limit. If the result wasn't a cutoff, meaning that if we didn't hit a cutoff on the limit, then we have some sort of result, okay? And that's it. It's such a simple conceptual algorithm to implement and it has really nice properties. So if we want to compare the search strategies overall, we had breadth first search, uniform cost search, depth first search, depth limited search, and iterative deepening depth first search. The only two we are going to be implementing in assignment one are breadth first search and depth first search. And they're very, very easy. And what we saw was that these are the preferable qualities that we want to have in our algorithm, right? So at first we had um, breadth first search and uniform cost search with nice properties. Then we saw that depth first search had nice space properties. And so we created iterative deepening depth first search, which combines the completeness and optimality of breadth first search with the space complexity of, um, of breadth or of depth first search, which is excellent. It's just, it's nicer, right? Okay. So just keep in mind that um, some of the terminology here um, all came from the, the optional textbook for the course. So the names are not necessarily that important, but the concepts are. And the algorithm that I'm about to introduce to you, um, the name comes from this textbook. So that, that's why I wanted to, to just state that. Okay. The last thing we'll talk about, I promise, <laughs> in this lecture is the idea of avoiding repeated states. Okay. It's one of the most important search ideas, especially important when we have reversible actions. Meaning that if I have an action of move left and I have an action of move right, then one of the possible paths that I might be searching is what happens if I move left, then move right, then move left, then move right, then move left, then move right. Ideally, we don't want to do that, right? We don't want to move left, then right, then left, then right. So most infinite loops and wasted time in search can be avoided by not returning to states that we've already visited. So what we're going to do is we're going to remember nodes that we've expanded or states that we've expanded and not re-expand them. That's all. 
And this is going to lead to possibly exponential savings in the number of nodes that we've generated. And this is going to be done by something called the closed list. All right. The closed list stores a set of states that we have already expanded. So the closed list stores expanded states, states, not nodes. It's often implemented as a hash table or a dictionary as for efficient lookup, but you can implement it however you want. And what we're going to do is check to see if a node is closed before expanding it. That's it. So we have a closed list. We store states that we've expanded already, and we just check to see if a node has a state which is in the closed list before expanding. And so we used to call this thing the fringe, but now because we call this thing the closed list, we're going to call the fringe the open list, okay? So we have an open list and we have a closed list. The open list is the fringe of things that we need to select from in order to continue our search. And the closed list is a list of states that we don't want to visit again. All right, so this, I've put in a couple of spaces here. This is the general tree search. That, well, that's what we called it. That's what it's called in the book. And it's the same algorithm, so I'm not going to go into it again. In order to turn this into this version of the algorithm where we avoid repeated states, we're just going to add in that closed list. Okay? So these are the changes that we're going to make. These three lines here. That's it. So before, what we did was we have the open list. Um, if the open list is empty, we've failed. Otherwise, we're going to choose a node from the open list. If it's the goal, we return solution. Otherwise, we add it to the open list. But what we're not doing here is checking to see, have I already been here before, right? So I could go, remember, A to D, A to D. So what we do is we introduce this closed list. So this closed list is going to be a set of states that we have already visited. So after we check to see if a node is the goal, we're going to just check to see, have we already visited this state before? If we have, continue, meaning don't expand this node, okay? If we've already visited the state that this node represents, do not expand this node. If we haven't visited, then we're going to add this state to the closed list and then continue on. So all we're doing, literally all we're doing, is we're adding a closed list and we're adding states that we expand to the closed list. And whenever we go to expand a new node, if we've already expanded a node with that state, we just don't do it, okay? And in the book, they call the open list only version tree search and the closed list version graph search. Again, it, those tree versus graph, they all operate on trees. It's just what they called it. I think I'm in the future, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave this name out because it's a little bit confusing. But I just wanted to, to show you that in the book, it's called graph search. So there we go. This is the algorithm that we're going to be using for assignment one. All you're gonna have to do is copy and paste this and translate it into JavaScript. I promise you, okay? So general graph search, it's only called graph search because that is how it's described in the AI textbook. It's still an algorithm that searches a search tree. It just uses a closed list to avoid repeated searching of nodes that represent the same environment state. So in assignment one, you're going to be implementing depth first search and breadth first search. So here's breadth first search. Here's depth first search. Look at it. One, there's, there's one character of code that's different, okay? So you're going to be implementing both of these algorithms. You are literally going to copy and paste the text out of this slide into the JavaScript and just change it slightly to be legal JavaScript. That's assignment one. Well, there's a little bit more, but that's assignment one in a nutshell. All right, so just remember um, tree search versus graph search. So tree search is without a closed list. Graph search is with a closed list. Tree search remembers nothing and will re-expand the same state multiple times. Graph search remembers state visits and will never re-expand the state a second time. And tree and graph search, that's just the name. So graph search complexity. The time complexity of graph search is insanely good. 
because we only expand each state once. So instead of being b to the power of d, we've just got big O of the number of states. So each state is expanded at most once. In the worst case, we're going to expand every state of the environment, and it's got the same upper bound no matter which str search strategy we use. So whether we're using breadth first search or depth first search or UCS or whatever, it's still got, it's just the most things we could possibly search is the number of states. And that's because we never search the same state twice. All right. The space complexity is also big O of the same number of states. Because if we only ever generate the number of states, well, that's the most we ever need, need to store, right? So if we're only generating this many, that's all we ever need to store. So the time complexity and space complexity of this is insanely good. It makes, makes this runnable, okay? However, graph search may no longer be optimal. It's a tricky issue. It, it depends on the underlying search strategy. So if we detect a repeated state, we're going to stop. However, that that may have been the optimal path. You see what I'm saying? So we're not going to reopen the search on a particular state more than once. However, that could have been the optimal path, but we've just stopped. So just realize that this graph search with a closed list may no longer be optimal. Um, so it's only optimal if we can guarantee that the first solution found is the optimal one. So for BFS and UCS, um, so for BFS with the same costs, it'll work, and UCS with the same costs, it'll work. So it's got the same optimality as BFS, essentially. All right, so that was a lot of stuff. Now just imagine me adding assignment one onto that, okay? So I went a little bit over time, I think like 15 minutes over time, but we got all of the data that we wanted. All right, so let's go back here. Just as a reminder, we do have assignment one coming up. Um, do not wait for the last minute for assignment one. It's the easiest of the assignments, but you could get tripped up, okay? I am going to have office hours next week, maybe on Wednesday, um, and I'll have that on Discord. So if you don't have Discord and you want to be part of my office hours, I can be on Discord on Wednesday um, to answer questions about the assignment because I'm sure I'm going to get 30 people asking about the assignment. It always happens. Um, on, on Thursday, we are going to talk about, sorry, when I say on Wednesday, I mean next Wednesday before the assignment is due. Um, so on Thursday, we're going to do a deep dive into how to set up the environment for assignment one, um, uh, what the assignment is all about, how to program it, huge tips for the assignment to make it as easy as possible for you to get through assignment one. Um, someone asked, okay, the, okay, the, the discord link expired. Yep. I will post a new discord link on D2L shortly. So that's it for this class. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, getting started with assignment one on, um, on Thursday. See you later.